Oh, no, I'm sorry, I can't say that. All right, so hi, my name is Ryan Van Cleef. I run the creative writing program. And one of the things about that that is so great is there are many perks like being able to do this. Let's welcome Bill Heinmarsh. So, where I'm going to begin off, uh, I'm going to wander away from this blank a bit. So, feel free to shout at me or put your hand in the air forward. If you have any questions, let me know if I have drifted outside of your shop. My name is Bill Heinmarsh. I'm a writer, graphic designer, game designer. Illustrator. Uh, my goal is to write one of everything I tell people because it makes the question of what you do go away. It makes people understand that I want to write a bunch of stuff and I haven't yet decided what we're going to do it. Uh, but games and specifically tabletop role playing games are where my heart lies. So everything that I do, that's where I come back to. Uh, I am not, by trade, a mathematician or a uh, programmer or uh, I have no degree in game theory and that is important and noted only for two reasons. One, there are terms that I have adopted and adapted that are not necessarily the same terms that you get for a particular game design because they're covering some kind of similar concepts. I use them for the purposes of uh, approaching from a creative writing perspective. Uh, and so if you're not uh, uh, confused, it's me uh, adding new terms. And uh, the other thing is that you also don't need a, theory, a, a, a degree in game design or a degree in game theory or whatever to bring your, school, your skills to bear on uh, gaming and game design and creative writing writing for the game space, creating playable spaces of any various variations you want on LARP or RPGs or story games or journal games or any of that stuff that, that this is going to apply to. This talk is called Five Means Mighty, or it's called Five Means Mighty, uh, and it's about making games from words and numbers. What that means in this case uh, is, I think so much planetary on one hand are games have a lot of that names and numbers and made up words and fantastic descriptions and stuff in them. Uh, but it's also a little bit about the fact that uh, men, numbers and words serve different purposes in game design. Uh, and they also overlap a great deal. But it's finding out which words and which numbers you're going to be using for what purposes is a, one of the big and recurring iterative design choices that you make. Uh, it is completely legit and normal to start with a game that is just stealing the uh, uh, attributes from another game for the purposes of saying, well, that, nobody knows what strength, dexterity, charisma, constitution, intelligence, and wisdom are for whether or not it's true, which your players might know what all this is for, and how this was to divide up a person. Uh, but then when you iterate on that, you find that your game might be about six different things, or we kind of really on on five things, or be about ten things. Uh, but I would refer at first to Dungeons and Dragons for two reasons. Uh, one is that it is kind of one of the lingua francos of gaming, a lot of people know these terms, whether or not they know these terms. Uh, and because its uh, actions are not particularly uh, esoteric, but they also have names that are somewhat evocative. So this is the idea of one particular character of D&D who is not represented by the standard D&D ability scores, which go from, for a variety of reasons, 3 to 20. Uh, this is the modifiers that those numbers translate into, because every ability score in D&D is not a number, it is at least two numbers. It is the number that you have. I have 18 strength, which is very, very good. I don't, but not this character. Uh, where you have a uh, 20 in wisdom, which is as high as it goes for a normal human. Uh, but what that gets you is a modifier in your die rolls for, let's say, minus one up to like four or five. So in other words, at d and you can say, I have a high charisma. Well, what does that mean? I have 18. Cool. What does that do for me? I get a plus four to all my die rolls. It's a lot of information packed into a little packet. Uh, but it's also not actually terribly descriptive. For one, uh, the scale from three to 20 is not a universally gut known Description, right? It's not, nobody says, hey, on a scale of 3 to 20, how do you like that movie? <laughs> on a scale of uh, uh, 11 to 19, about how hot do you want your curry, right? It's not, I've never heard that. Uh, and I'm not probably going to hear that. But the uh, uh, question when you see stats like this is D, D characters are designed to be people in ways that are important to the game, not to be whole people. If you imagine that all the various options and ways there are to be a person are encompassed in something like a color wheel, this is all the possibilities of the ways to be a character, not even necessarily a real person, but a fictional character, a fictional person. Uh, you might have to go into this and say, well, pick five colors, and those five colors combine to be your character. Uh, what do the colors represent? We're going to, we would have to join that. We have to say, well, the cool colors are the physical colors, and the warm colors are the socio emotional colors. And uh, the more uh, red it gets, the more socially appealing, the more performatively approved of by your society, the quicker people are. 
But the point is, is that if you form little intersections and you pick spots on the color wheel, you say my character is uh, like, like a hexadecimal code for a website in colors. I'm this warm, this cold, this blue, this green, this red. Uh, without references, that doesn't necessarily help us, but the point is that there are lots of ways to zoom in on this sort of concept, including, for example, the abilities for D&D, &D, which decided all people are broken down into six core styles. Each one of those is arguably the same level of importance to the character, and that they all apply to something in the game that you want to be doing and want to be good at. There aren't stats that are bad stats, like none of those stats is uh, ineptitude, capital I. There's no stat that indicates how likely you are to fall off your horse. There are stats that help you understand whether or not you're good at horse riding, but there's not a stat in which the higher the number, the more inept you are. So there are positive descriptions of your character, and they are supposed to be roughly equal, but that's not always the case. Uh, there are, depending on the game that you play, if it's a game that has no social interaction, there's a dump stat. People say, well, don't put it in, put your terrible numbers in charisma because we never use it in this game. Uh, or they say, you stay steady for everything because our game is all about Robin Hoods and bows and arrows and elves and stuff. Uh, but that is subjective to the campaign and the instance of the game you play, whereas the game itself is technically balanced with all six of those stats equally. And it uses numbers to do it because numbers are precise. And numbers are focused, and numbers order things. They say that five is above four is above three. And you can say, well, how strong are you? I'm pretty strong. Well, no, but I can scale one to five. How strong are you? I'm a four. Well, I'm a five, so I'm good. And you can't really argue, well, it's five higher than four. Well, you know, it's actually you come at it from the north. And you can't swing, you should know five is number four. You know that, that's how numbers work. Uh, whereas if you gave them just descriptions, I might. Yeah, but I have uh, uh, unstoppable themes. Okay, great. Or I'm a uh, uh, relentless. Cool. This is helping us, but I don't necessarily know if mighty is better than relentless, or if tough is better than strong. I don't know necessarily how this works. They are now they're evoking words evoke, words conjure. Uh, words give us lots of opportunities and options, whereas numbers pin stuff down for us. Another way of saying that, which I really like, is that numbers answer questions and words ask them. In a game of Marvel superheroes, you might say, "Who is the mightiest Avenger?" And if you don't have a game system involved, the player can argue about it all day long because they're talking words. And they'll use numbers as metaphors, but they're talking words. Yeah, Thor can do this. Yeah, Thor can do that. If you're talking about it in numbers, once you quantify those characters, there's a, there are certain arguments that you kill dead. For better or for worse. Often for better, but often for worse. Which is to say, Thor has a strength of 18, and the Hulk has a strength of 35, so the Hulk is stronger. We're not arguing with the argument stuff. It's all that problem. Uh, it creates some problems, which is, yeah, but what if I want to tell a story about them fighting? Can I tell that story, or is the story a sentence that says, uh, Hulk has a higher strength, Hulk wins? That's not a story. Uh, so the words ask questions, hey, what happens to your character the first time they kill in a game? And the, you don't answer that with, you know, free. They, they feel bad about free. D&D, there's no rating for that kind of level of emotion. You have to talk about it. Put it into words. You ask the question, how does your character feel the first time they defeat a cobalt? And the answer is, uh, I feel uh, about as bad as the nine hit points I dealt to him. It doesn't really work. But you say, I feel I feel surprised that, that the sight of, of, of cobalt blood is stirring my character in ways that, that they don't like. That it both was thrilling and also terrifying. And you start getting into what we sometimes call uh, the fruitful void or the blank page problem, which is uh, you create a box be filled. Uh, the blank page problem is something you can encounter this a lot in a game like design called Storium, which is an online storytelling game uh, in which players are creative writers um, writing about different game worlds, and there isn't really a GM, there can be, uh, but everybody's writing fiction, and there's a game that helps them decide what to write and when, as that is more important than the game as an adjudicator. The game doesn't necessarily determine whether or not to succeed or fail. That's a fictional question. You can have a certain number of failures and a certain number of successes, and you decide when to use them. And they don't reset until you resolve them. And in a game like that, what we encountered was what we call the blank page problem, which is no, you can write anything. That's which is the same thing as saying, write everything. You can write anything. Okay, well, I'm going to instead sit quietly and watch other people play this game because I don't want to write it yet. That's a skill that maybe I don't have in the game sort of hasn't taught because the game is addressed with write anything. That's not, that's not, uh, that's an expectation. It is not a, it is not a, a, a teaching aid. Uh, but the blank page problem is uh, the what, what Aaron Sorkin calls the threat of the blank page. The blank page that sits there and says, you want to dance with me? I could be anything you want. I could be everything in the universe. No pressure. Uh, you tell somebody instead, hey, how do you feel about killing your first cold? We've zoomed way in. 
And we have a blank page, we have a blank line, we have a field to fill in. But now we're talking about something specific. I have barriers I can play off. Numbers can provide those barriers. So if you have a character like this in DMD, in which they have a 8 in strength and an 18 in intelligence, or 18 in wisdom, uh, some middling scores in like uh, uh, intelligence and constitution, they're pretty dexterous, right? There are a lot of ways to interpret these, and no one number is doing it. The way the numbers interplay is helping you do it. So that, that rapport, the conversation, the, and what we don't work in the numbers is having a conversation. We universe some words, not numbers, just in terms of the, the way the metaphors work. Uh, but everything is in conversation when it comes to data. Everything contextualizes its neighbors. So what do we see here? What is the kind of person that you might visualize, in D&D or not? Something that is weak, physically weak, but not like necessarily like uh, uh, Clumsy. They have a dexterity that's up there. Uh, somebody who's very wise, but of average intelligence, right? Uh, so somebody who might be clever, but not particularly well informed. They just they're they maybe early in their career, something like that. What are some different ways we have to interpret somebody who's like this? What is somebody that you can think about? And that I haven't answered, but it's the question for uh, interpreting the play space that you created. You don't just create six characters as a certain character of mental character, a uh, uh, wise character, a charismatic character. You're creating this color wheel where there are all these possible interplays and connections and ways to get at the destination color that that character is going to represent. Do you get there by going through, do, do I create a character who has a uh, uh, agile Legolas style dexterity but is also uh, frail and, and uh, delicate and uh, 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 spelt so the, the strong enough and can get by in battle, but relies on their uh, uh, their quick aim rather than the, their mighty sword. Uh, all the ways you have to rely on that kind of notion, whatever this character is describing, means that you're once you create that spectrum, you either chop it up into sections. My character is an orc. My character is a fighter. My character is a barbarian or a bard. And the classes divide up the concept of color wheel into sections that you have ways to approach it. Or you can give somebody the whole spectrum and say, you make anything. And obviously that in itself creates a creating spectrum by which you can give people lots of descriptions inside of it. So once again, we get to the notion that every ability score is equal, whether or not they are in each campaign, but each one represents the same 17% of DD. Uh, they don't represent the same 17% of every character. And so in communicating to the audience and the players how the numbers are going to work is done is a factor of the analog feature of words. Words can think of them as analog. Numbers are not necessarily digital because digital relies on fewer numbers, but numbers are digital. Uh, so imagine that you took those same people, the same character we saw before, and instead of using the six even ability scores, we had four. What are four ways, what are what four stats did you pick to keep from Dungeons and Dragons that you can only use for? And if anybody immediately has a gut reaction to like, well, I would totally get rid of Constitution, or I'm going to get rid of Dexterity, because I think I could just replace, we could just call strength athleticism. And then it'll just cover all the physical stuff I don't want to worry about. Uh, but so if you had to have four, or if you were to use five, or all right, five, seven, you can have to have black because hit points are like a stat. Or you can you get numbers to align, uh, you could go up below, I guess. And then now there are a lot of stats because we have saving throws, and we have skills, and we have all these other numbers that are intersecting and interacting to create one character out of the color wheel by slicing up. The possibilities and giving these little boxes, these little blank, blank pages that are easier to answer than on a scale of one to ten. How is your character? You know, your character. How is your character? Oh, that is maximum character. No. <laughs> because the answer is always going to be ten. Uh, I do need to ask a couple of questions to proceed part of this before we go into Q and A. Uh, who here is fine with the question of favoritism? Like, I have favorite movies, or I have favorite food, or I have this kind of what I'm generally not, but I'm fine asking that question. Anybody here who knows why I'm talking about? That? I mean, who here knows some of their favorite foods? That's comfortable talking about this. Okay, great. So, uh, what are your three, in any order, your three favorite foods? Pizza. Pizza. Margaritas. Margaritas. Chocolate cake. Pizza, margaritas, chocolate cake. Love it. What was that? Uh, now, I'm random. Pizza. That's the top or the bottom? Okay. Pizza, margaritas. Great. <laughs> <laughs> So, on a, a scale of one to three, we rate pizza at the top, yeah. margaritas in the middle, so that's two, and chocolate cake at the bottom. Yeah. So is that chocolate cake number three or number one? Are we counting down or counting up? Pizza would be number three. Three? Yeah. 
three is the most yeah. most liked. Okay, great. Two, one. Great. Because numbers, if you have a stat, I'm going to pick on one to the game here in a second. If you have a stat, that a higher number means more or something. Right? There's a game, a uh, beautiful game, it's a great game for large monsters. We've got wizards in the dark ages. And it's a stat called Peace Factor. And the higher that number, the harder something is to do. That's not an easy factor, it's difficult. That's not more easy. Right? So that's one of those ways in which when you pick a word, you put up the number, you decide, wait, wait, are they saying the same thing? Are they in conversation? Are they backwards for a reason? In this case, we said, no, that one's the most liked, it's your most favorite phrase, so it's the highest number. But people all do the opposite, and always have to be understanding, right? You count down. And the number one position is pizza. I agree. But that's number one position. So it has the most, so we put it in number one. And yet we're generally not confused by this. So here's the, the last version. So on a scale of one to ten, how much do you like pizza? Cool. On a scale of one to ten, how much do you like margaritas? On a scale of one to ten, how much do you like chocolate? Okay. Five. Okay. Right? The ranking system did not reveal how close those were. Once we had the resolution, the higher resolution of 10 options to give us a sense of where these are relative to each other, we had also the ranking system imposed on you that the, the choice of pizza and margaritas can be tied. They had to be ranked. Once we asked 1 to 10, what is the rating? We went with their top. Both legit, both legal ways of approaching it. Neither one of them does enough. But together, they show us both. Uh, uh, the options and the opportunities involved for players for description, for turning numbers into a descriptive, almost analog style process. Uh, similarly, what are your, uh, somebody, I'm going to close raise their hands, back your head, who's willing to answer a question real quick. Um, uh, in single digit numbers, what are your top five single digit numbers? What? Right? <laughs> that question doesn't make any sense. Right? Is it, are, am I asking a question based on favoritism? Am I asking a question based on, well, I guess the five highest single digit numbers? So. Nine, eight, seven, I guess those are the best, right? Numbers don't have, they answer questions, but they don't necessarily sufficiently answer bad questions. <laughs> and you want to be asking questions of the players and the characters and things that make sense in a way that if you were going to ask them a scale of one to ten, how much do you like margaritas? Okay, I get it. So ten is not the best. Ten, I like them a lot. Great, terrific. We have some idea. Uh, single digit numbers, top five. Well, so is that just one through five? <laughs> those are pretty good numbers. I get a lot of use of them. Uh, similarly, how much is in a handful? I say, bring me a handful of dice. How many dice do you bring? Six. Six? Why? Some tiny hands. <laughs> so that's the many you your hand? Yeah. Cool. You don't bring me five? Is this a handful? <laughs> I seriously, I ask this question, this is a question of the bunch, because there are, there are assumptions that we have from words and their values and their ratings and their meanings. Where somebody goes, a handful, that, that's five. I'm counting. I didn't say bring me four, I said bring me a full hand of dice. I always have interpreted it to mean, no, as many dice as I can fit my hands. I should bring you a or just one grab. A grab's worth, a unit of grab. That's how many dice you should bring me. Uh, it's also, though, the question if I hold this hand, uh, what number is this? One. One? Yeah. One hand? Great. Cool. So you see one. Anybody else see a different number other than one? Five, right? Counting figures. This is a thing we need to count. One of my curtains. Is and I've got, I do not of course, remember the names, this has to be checked because a fishing culture in North America, uh, 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 in addition to fishing culture, for whom this number is four, which is magical to me because that's how many fishing lines you can pinch and carry on in one trip. Uh, uh, and that might be folklore as far as I know, but the point still is it's a perfectly reasonable way of interpreting this. And in a game design, you get to decide, take that back to the same hand that somebody else might be playing a different game with and say, in this game, this is four because this is a game about pinching fishing lines. That it's about how, much, how many resources you can bring home to feed your family. So that is important. And that's part of the element where we sometimes say game design is mind control, which is game design is the ability to rewire one's language and expectations so that you think about something that is already familiar to you in a different way, to contextualize it in that different way. Uh, so we've looked at the, yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. So it's about um, contextualizing your information in a different way. It's about uh, taking something that was familiar, that they can use every day and thinking about it differently. So for example, this isn't five or one, this is four, which is not such a stretch, but it did not occur to me, but it blew my mind when I found that out. I took this the same hand that I've always had and added a number to it. And so that ability to take something that people are familiar with and have them think about it, just even the same thing from a different direction, uh, to look at it differently. Uh, I understand how many of us were here for John Cassidy's talk yesterday. Uh, okay, good, there's a little bit of overlap, I didn't want to dig too far into it. If everybody here has already done this, 
one of those questions is uh, about the number of stats that you need to represent a character. Let's assume, for simplicity's sake, we're going to play a game uh, about uh, fishing folk who also fight monsters to get their fish. They have to beat sea monsters to, to get fish and bring them home. But you only have three stats because, it's a, because the weight of the game, the size of the book, the amount of time you have to produce it, and the fact that you only have two or three pages to work. What are some stats we want this game, that this game can be about? Is fish, like, fishing could be a stat, right? Sure. Fighting. Fighting, right? You're fighting sea monsters to get fish. Sure. So let's start, I'm not, we're not going to find ourselves there. So fighting, or athleticism, or combat, or something. Sorrow. Sorrow. How do you feel, one, because it's a three-page indie game, so it's going to make me feel sad. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. It's going to make me feel, question how I feel about doing the thing the game charged me with doing, right. attached me with doing. Uh, but also because it's not sorrow, so it tells us that maybe the characters are supposed to feel great about fishing and killing monsters, or maybe we're supposed to feel bad about it, but by just making it sorrow, we know that we're going to ask, how do you feel about it? On a scale from 1 to 10, how sorrow are you about catching all those fish? Uh, what's the third stack you might want to roll in uh, to uh, project onto the game? Yeah? Boat. Boat. Boat? Yes. Great. That is boat. Interesting. And now this is the thing I would ask, uh, uh, this is the purpose like this. How would you describe it to make that about the character? It's a character stat, not the boat stat, not the village stat. Totally doable. It's, it's, uh, um, let me here. it's the, the best possible boat that your character would be able to build because everybody has to build right on their own boat. So in this case, so now and now we're seeing how already the game design is informing how we're going to design the game world in fiction. Because what we've said here is that the boat stat determines what kind of boat we can have, whether we build it or buy it, it talks about resources, it talks about skill in that way. So this is how we come to understand whether or not we have a boat of what kind, how many resources we have, how we feel about the activity, and how we are the activity itself. Now, if for whatever reason you were like, but I love this game to be able to do a lot more things, you might have seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven stats. Some of them might be equal, some of them might be unequal. Hit points in Constitution are, for example, in D&D, Constitution determines hit points. They're closely related. But there are stats in D&D that you might have uh, like, uh, it is a stat, how many arrows do you have? Some games don't care. They say, whatever, I don't want to count arrows. But also, in d d you could say, whatever, I don't want to count hit points. Am I alive or not? Right? Those are wildly different potency questions when related to what d d is about. But they're not that far apart because you can't play d d as an archer if you run out of arrows, but if you just say, I don't want to count arrows, and you just, yeah, that's cool, none of us do. Okay, well, there's a fundamental stat we're just kind of projecting from the fiction and the, and the game itself, and the game runs along. The game keeps coming, everything's fine. But it raises the question of numbers that go up or down, let's say, in our three-stat our three fiction game. Uh, more is better, so, or not say more is better, more is more potent. So the more higher I have in fishing or in fighting, the better my uh, uh, ability to fight sea monsters and get fish. The higher my stat in sorrow, the more I feel, or the more potently, or the more acutely, or the more aware I am of my feelings about something, perhaps. Or even just the, the sadder, and therefore, by the standards of my people in this game, the more virtuous I feel about the process of the job. Uh, and then both, which is the better quality of the boat that I have. Higher is better. Uh, if you have a game like D&D where those numbers only go up, ability scores in D&D almost never go down. When they do, it's temporary, at least in the current vision of D&D. If that number only goes up, then over time your character becomes more and more of the character you picked at the beginning. Those numbers get higher and higher. If they go up and down, your character can become other characters over time. You move throughout the color wheel. I started off with a five and everything, and I ended up with almost everything being my red stat, and almost nothing else than cool numbers because of the things that had happened to my character along the way. Uh, and then that itself, that binary is kind of illusion. There's lots of ways in between to have numbers that are meant to go up or want to go up, but they go down occasionally. Uh, so numbers that are in flux say different things than numbers that are static or numbers that only go in one direction. Uh, which is another way of pointing out the context of how you define what's in a number, what the thing is for, indicates how numbers become words, how numbers become analog, how them in context with two numbers can interact in a way that a number at beautiful certainty cannot. Uh, one of the examples that I love for this is if I want to describe a person in a number, I say, I want, I want this social security number. I want to meet that person. I want whoever, I want to meet whoever personal ID number 3276612722 is. I want to meet that person. That is an individual indicated by a number. If I want to say, I want to meet Alaskan crab fishermen who have seen UFOs, and who believe that they have found valuable shipwrecks but are keeping it to themselves for now, I get a different group of people. 
I get a wide swath of data. And I might get the same number of people. I might even get that same person. I don't know. But I'm casting a wider shadow and a wider net in that area to, to involve and, and, and draw in more people, more options and possibilities. Uh, before I get into the blank page problem, which is going to some or deeper into the blank page problem, which is going to lead to some questions for you again. Uh, first, I will ruin D and D for you by changing some names. The six stats we are now going to use for Dungeons and Dragons, and therefore for our fishing game and riff on it, that we will expand back out to six stats. Instead of strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma, we're going to use the stats memory, jocularity, hand size, cowardice, impudence, and clout. Same game, I'm just changing those stats. I'm just changing six words. Right? Numbers will be the same, stats will be the same, how they interact with will be the same. In this case, I guess it means the hat size will determine your hit points. Uh, we'll be on the same scale, we'll all be 20s, we'll do the same thing, right? You get it. So now it's an easy end of the game because we all understand D and D, and we all know what a high rating of Indians means. What if I have a high rating and a high cowardice? A high competence and a high cowardice? Kind of, how might I act? What would you expect? I'm very, but the stat because more better is more so. I'm also very cowardly. What is an impudent coward? Like? What is a cowardly impudent or cowardly revolutionary or cowardly uh, uh, loudmouth look like? That's a tough one. Yeah, I just sort of double down on the very so Right, that's a very real way. I think part of the question maybe would be a matter of. Not just what bad is the way I think, which is kind of impudence about the land. Right? To me, one of the thoughts is if I was high impudence and high cowardice, impudence, I might want to, I'm constantly speaking out against the people who are making me mad, and I'm constantly trying to defy orders, but never when they're in the room. <laughs> right? Or never when I might get caught about it. Or if I have uh, low cowardice and low impudence, what is that together? Low cowardice, so I might be brave, and I'm not impudent. What, my, what my attitude might be like. What might you expect from me as a person, right? And if somebody wants to shout something out, I'll accept it. But we don't. I'm stewing on it is the answer. It's an acceptable answer. Uh, jocularity is one of these stats that you don't get in role playing games a lot. Or actually, frankly, one of these things I love in D and D is this, there's no stat for bravery. And that's I might be really good that there's no number that bravery is not reduced to a digit. Because the question said becomes, well, what have you done and how you felt about it? And DD the game doesn't particularly drive those questions, but neither does it get in the way of them. The, the content, the environment, the game world can ask those questions. But the game doesn't say, uh, your character almost died, but now is fine. They're, they're fully healed. And that's just, that's SOP. That's every day. It's great. Carry on. Do, do as you will. You'll probably almost die a hundred times this week. Yeah. Uh, I just, you know this, I'm sure, but some of the older editions of D&D, the NPCs do basically have a bravery rate. They have right. around the bravery right. rate. So and they, they get the role to see if they should now. Right. But you don't. And that's actually, that's great. You just push the ball forward to a point I'm going to make anyway. Because there's a game Lord of the Rings Online uses the stat morale plus hit points. Of course, the same one. Right. It's still a, a meter, and when it goes to zero, you're out. It's morale. You run out of morale, you're out of the fight, and wake up back in Hellman's house, whatever. Go on in your life to have an adventure. Because the, what it's calling the question is a different thing. And the other reason why NPCs might have bravery and player characters might not is because uh, a variety of game design issues that kind of circle around the idea that if I fail a bravery check, am I still in control of my character in a way that is pleasant and amusing for me as a player? Is that fun? And the answer can be yes, depending on what the game is about and how it is about it. But it can also be an NPC has a bravery check because it's a rapid way of determining, not playing that character necessarily, but determining what is that character going to do. It still also doesn't ask a lot of questions about how does the character feel about their own bravery? How does the character feel about your bravery? How does the character feel about the fact that you use its bravery in place of your own? Uh, these are part of what is meant to call the proof of word of the blank page, which again is the notion of creating a box and filling it, and how you fill it, and what tools you can play to fill it with. This is why I think about stats as they're very small boxes. Strength is, will only contain numbers of the following kind, and those numbers will be in this. The name line of character sheet can be much harder to fill in. It is for me. I love names. I love naming characters. I'm very slow at doing it. Thomas Aquinas Hermes. Uh, 
the fruitful voyage, what this big part of this next exercise is about. Uh, but I want to show you stats from that fill that box in a different way. These are numerical stats in a game like Lady Blackbird or my Cyberpunk Action Adventure game, Always Never Now. And then each one of these represents a die. They're all the same. You get one dice every time you invoke one of these in the description. So if you're playing a detective and you can describe how they are being questioned and they're being quick and they're observant and they're using a systematic approach, they, they flash that smile. Uh, and maybe this time they're not intimidating. You get a dice from each one of those, and the more dice is better in this game. So you're invoking this opportunity to say, tie together the words and the numbers into a way that is engaging the fiction, if you will. And that term means, right, that the game isn't just asking a numerical question, it's asking a question of the game world, which is not necessarily, so what are you doing? Which can be, I'm strength, I'm using strength at it, I'm charisma at it. Uh, the question is, how are you doing it? Especially in a game which said, you will always roll five dice, but which five dice? They're all the same. They're all six sides. Is that the same? And the game makes it so that the answer is no, it matters to us today in this space, at this table. It matters to us which, what the six sides are and how they're rolling. And that's one of the tools that you have to, when I mean contextualizing numbers and giving <coughs> questions to players that are, they can be obvious questions. I want some of the non obvious questions, but that are questions that help the players get fruitful and enticing and engaging and provocative to them and answer. Uh, so even these words, like these are also equally numerical words. In play, quick, a stat in my experience is worth more because you can use it for almost anything. When you have a stat that's like quick, players almost never, unless you, as, a, as a GM, you can sculpt the situation because you want things to go slowly. But players are often like, yeah, boom, I do it, I just do it, I lash out, and I, and I ask a question, and they say, yeah, I killed them, and I'm a great attack. I did it like that. It's all the, it's all the case of the uh, I want to do this fast. Uh, I don't want to ask any questions. I want to just be observant and tell him. I can tell him she killed that guy because he's got his blood on your shoes. Uh, and I can know whose blood that is because I'm systematic and I scanned it with my laser or whatever. Uh, so they're not equal in one category, which is how easy are they to use, but they would be equal in another category, which is how powerful are they to use. And deciding what question marks you're putting into your game design is the way in which you say what your game is about, in addition to how it is about it. And that question is always super important because it's, it's in many ways easier to answer the question what is your game about. Because we often start with that. This, this is a game about killing monsters and taking their stuff. This is a game about running around in the medieval world and putting hit points back on people before the monsters to finish them off. This is a game in the medieval emergency medical conditions. This is a game in which uh, Interstellar fighter pilots protect mail planes so they can deliver messages across the heavens. How is it about? Oh, they're all, all those games are comics. Every one of those games is on farce. They're all MASH. But when I say they're all like MASH, they're also really, they also have a lot of parts. Well, what's the number? Like, okay, so on, on the color wheel, right? Show me the hexadecimal one of the CMYK code that indicates the mix of comedy and drama that is your game. My game is red 80%. Green 60%, right? Uh, 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 it's a mix of colors that arrives with a kind of taupe. That's my game. It's kind of taupe. Or it's better to say, here's three sentences about my game. Here's eight words about my character. This is the part that you're going to get I hope. <laughs> this is the fun part. Uh, haiku is not a game, but it is playful. And I don't know why it's not a game. We can argue about that. And I hope you do. There's still some time left in the conference. Uh, <laughs> But it has rules, uh, it has been a game, it has been parts of games, it is, it's a thing when you sit on the hillside and you say, you there, give me a high crew about what you see here with the trees, and then we will judge it and judge you. What, what criteria are we using? I don't know yet. We'll decide when we hear the high crew and say, it's too long, or it's too short, or it's too, it lacks a seasonal reference, or it's cutting word, it was confusing, or it rhymed, we don't like that. Uh, but it still has rules, five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables, which are also adaptations from earlier rules that have nothing to do with the way that syllables work in English or the way that syllables work in Japanese. Uh, but in the modern English language haiku, this is one of the core rules, five, seven, five. Even in Kyoto, hear the cuckoo crying, I long for Kyoto. It's a basically perfect little nugget of haiku right there. That's by that show, one of the four great masters of haiku of your. Uh, and it does all the various steps that you want a haiku to do 
Even in Kyoto, so it's a scene, we know roughly where we are in Kyoto, it's all the solo accounts. Here in Cuckoo Cry, a cuckoo is a seasonal reference. A cuckoo cries certain times of the year. It is present in Kyoto at certain times of the year. It has a cutting word. Even in Kyoto, here in Cuckoo Cry, people are building, we're establishing, we're setting up the scene. I long for Kyoto. Okay, now it's about the speaker, not, not about the place, but the speaker. The phone made a turn, and also, not how I thought it was going to end. Not where I thought it would go. Because we're longing for Kyoto, but we're, we're, you're there, we're, we're in it, you're there right now, it's fine. Well, how, how do you long for a place where you are? It ebbs out beyond the poem itself. I walk around this poem all the time in my head. I love this poem. Uh, Kobayashi Aisa, one of the four great masters, has a poem which is, uh, and the translation from Japanese, so the, the solo count is not right, okay, but it's bright harvest or bright autumn moon, pond snails crying in the saucepan. Love that. And part of that is it has a visual rhyme, but so it does some great rules of haiku. The bright parts moon in the saucepan are little visual, they're big circles. The pond snails themselves are fine in one line, and now they're not. Well, fine, at least in the sense that they're not in a pain, and now they're in a pain. Uh, the rules of haiku, therefore, are there to create a playful and fun blank box, and then help you fill it. But not help you fill it so much that it isn't a challenge to fill it and isn't fun to fill it. And it's only fun, of course, if you've already enjoyed this game. But it's not necessarily easy. These are the rules of haiku don't necessarily make it easier, but they make it easier to start. They make it easier to know how you answer the question and when you have answered the question. Uh, I'm going to give you one more maybe about haiku here, which is uh, uh, so we have the 575, no rhymes, the traditional rule of haiku, they shouldn't rhyme. Uh, uh, if you accidentally run the haiku, that's worse than rhyming on purpose. Uh, it should include a seasonal reference. Oh, these, by the way, there are lots of variations on these rules. These are the ones that I sort of adapted uh, to my own life. Uh, I did for a, I only took it for a year to write a haiku every day, and I did not make it the whole year. Uh, because I, I'm a freelancer and I work from home, and I can only write so many haikus about my desk. Uh, but uh, uh, different people adopt and adapt the rules, which is another way of saying people hack and drift haiku all the time. The rules of haiku are always in motion. Uh, and for all that we talk about whether or not games are always in motion, or a game has a finite set of rules, there are so many assumptions that are being made. My assumption is that D&D needs, you should count the arrows you have to equip for D&D to play. But that's a hack of D&D, a very small one, a very minor trick, and you go, you have infinite ammunition. Also, by the way, I can think about how important this difference is when you say it. If you say, we don't count arrows, and somebody else says, you have infinite ammunition, those are not the same sentence. That leads you in, that leads you similar executions of play, but if you ever say you have infinite ammunition, then players can just, they, they approach the question of how big or how fast or whether or not their quiver is empty magically or refilled magically, it raises questions. What you say and how you say it matter. Uh, whether you're writing a haiku or whether you're writing a game rule. Uh, the cutting word is a super important one in haiku that I like because cutting words are one of these technologies that exist in programming, which is poetry. They exist in that kind of code. Uh, they do exist in game rules, in my opinion. I think the game rules uh, uh, can be a form of poetry or prose, and that all writing is on a spectrum of poetry and prose. You don't necessarily have to check a box. You can have poetic prose, you can have prosaic poetry. Uh, but it's a kind of concept that I think is super valuable, and we're kind of just the beginning of utilizing it, especially in lyric games. Uh, look at the lyric games and the descriptions of it by John Harness. Uh, and we're also looking at it in bar rules and micro games. We're looking at it in games that are sort of meant more to be experienced or read or absorbed than they are to be necessarily played, or that are at least giving value, equal value to both. Uh, and sometimes it's just a matter of making a rule of it is fun and engaging to read, and rather than telling you what the genre is, genre is Yeah, just can you do a fine cutting word? I'm about to. Oh, sorry. No, 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 no. And, uh, 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 so, but yes, good question. Because a cutting word in the haiku is what we saw right after the Google was crying. That's where the poem turns. The cutting word is the line, the dotted line, the scene in the poem. And it's not always the end of the second line, but that's the traditional point. Because you have two lines of staff in the first act and the second act of the poem. And then you have a surprise. In uh, uh, Isa's pond snails, the surprise is also there, and the cutting word is between the, between the end and second line and the beginning of the first line. And you can credit it to generally the last word of the first part is the cutting word. So for example, bright harvest moon, pond snails crying, both crying, crying is the cutting point of both of those poems. Uh, in the saucepan. 
at the credit card computer, looking, we would trigger our attention from out the window and listening to snails, and that would look down from one circle of the moon to the second circle of the frying pan. And we're in that. We've, we've changed, we've tilted the camera. This is a great one actually that I just read. I'm not sure if it's still kind of on it right, so forgive me. Um, uh, and it's again rhymes with Basha's cuckoo. Uh, is uh, uh, the mountain cuckoo bay, it's not cuckoo sings. The, mountain, the, the, the nearby mountain cuckoo is a crybaby. The cuckoo is definitely half a ball, but the cuckoo word there is cuckoo. Because it creates the cuckoo, and then maybe it says, says this is all about a cuckoo and how I can't stand it. That's just, it doesn't have to be a big term. Uh, uh, the, one of the popular ones, and this is a great repetition of the credit word, is uh, uh, haiku, write a haiku, or haiku are easy, but sometimes they don't make sense. Refrigerator. The credit word there is the word sense, and refrigerator is the term. Uh, and a credit word in game design is uh, not necessarily seen in the sense of a break or in the sense of a change of, of uh, uh, context, but it's a change of direction. A cutting word, you know, is a, uh, a cutting word makes a question a loaded question. It's the term, it's the part that makes a question more surprising than it is direct. So, for example, the question, how do you feel about slaying your first kobold? How do you feel about slaying sea monsters and catching fish? That's a more open question. You have all the hows you want in the world to answer. And including the fact that you can say, you can hold back when you answer that question. You can give me a, a, a more beautiful or a more prosaic notion. You can make me feel how you want to feel about it. If I say, using only lies, tell me how you feel about killing kobolds. That question has a term, has a curve in it. Using only lies, tell me how you feel about slaying kobolds. But it's still really, and now it's a game that you have to think, okay, wait, I feel this way, so I have to say this. Not much of a game, but it has that, it has a place to it, it has a dimension to it. And that it is not direct and it is not the affirming immediate truth. Or uh, on a scale of one to ten, how much do you like margaritas? It adds a term to the question and it therefore changes the shape of it. The answer will come in the form of a number. Uh, I'm a big believer in this notion, by the way, of the, the blank page problem and the open box, the proof of what giving it a shape, not necessarily a box, and that's important. Giving it a shape is very good to think about it. It could be a splat, it could be a big, just splatter of polished style paint on a page, you color that in, you get any color you want. Now it's, now it's a dexterity game. Can I get my crayon into all those little bunch of crayons? Did you just read it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, does anybody here want to help me with a haiku? We could do this in this group, this is how it works. Uh, we'll each do a line of the haiku. Uh, and after this, I'll take questions. I will reward you for the ability to say, the hell are you talking about? <laughs> uh, 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 somebody give me the seasonal reference. And if it fits the five syllable count for the first line, that's great, but it's not required. But I want to know a seasonal reference. Something that tells us when, and thereby potentially by extension, where this poem is set. Is it autumn? Is it? Yeah, right. You want the whole line? Sure. Apple blossoms fall. Apple, apple blossoms fall. Great. Apple blossoms fall. The next line is going to be completely cutting work. It's easy to put it at the end because it gives you more setup, but it doesn't have to be at the end. Cutting words can go at the beginning of lines and go anywhere, but let's include the cutting word in the next line. Uh, and because we're inside the head of the poet here, we're playing the poet. Ryan, what is the vibe that you have inside that you're evoking with the apple blossoms fall? Like, just gives us a sense of melancholy. Am I writing this on the line that says, give me a melancholy line? Or am I writing this in the box that says, speak to me happily about? Let's go up. Uh, uh, great. So give me something. Uh, 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 beautiful about the, the, the moment that you're in right now. Apple blossoms fall. Falling blossoms, falling. Yeah, so apple blossoms fall. Uh, what's the direction that we want to take? What's the turn? What's the surprise? It can be witty. It can be, uh, uh, this is a great one by uh, Isa, which is, uh, 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 okay, this little kind of is off from the translation, but uh, celebrating New Year's outside, cheers and dancing up and down the street. I feel about it. <laughs> right? Not a major turn in the sense of like, it's not a sudden rending your clothes and gnashing your teeth, but it works. I love it. Uh, so, what's the direction we want to take? Rye? Melancholy now instead? Happier still? 
Uh, uh, turnabout, which is a form of kind of cutting work, which is where you just take the camera and turn it all the way around so we realize that we're seeing the apple blossoms falling from inside a house fire. Yeah. Uh, adding that element. Who's got a sense of which way they want it to go? I'll do the work for you. They're not going to be responsible for it. Which direction do we want to turn? Should we go up or down? Happier? Sadder? Jason says sadder. We have two for happier, three for happier, five. Okay, so happier is going to be. Sorry. <laughs> This game, which means that this is, this is an indie game, but it's more likely to be a water card game than this to be a lot of our role play game. That's not fair. Um, uh, so if it's uh, uh, Apple Blossoms Fall, uh, is the first line five syllables, let's put the cutting word near the end. Um, uh, trees growing higher each day. Which is a play on fall and rise, but we can make that more beautiful. So let's say it's something like uh, uh, trees reach higher. Uh, the tree reaches higher still. Still is a kind of word suggests that the tree is still. It's in motion. We have the sense right now that the blossoms are falling. It's a serene little motion. So if it's still is the kind word. We want to change the direction now. We want to go up. Uh, the direction is out of blossoms fall, uh, tree reaching higher, thereabouts, uh, higher still. To make that even higher, what is the third thing now that we can add, an element, that says, look at this in a different way, ne narrow widen, yeah. Rising. Right, so higher, higher still. And now we're adding fire to this. The right, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Cool, so yeah, one you could add the supernatural, right? We have this very simple, this, this mundane, serene motion, and now you add the supernatural, and especially if it is, uh, boy, I am so just coded by the games I've been playing, which is that I'm like, and of course that means the, the Phoenix has to rise out of a fire, so the tree must be on fire. No, that's not, a, that's not a must. We have lots of options. So, uh, uh, oh, maybe the Phoenix is, is hatching from, a, from an egg in that tree. We use the structure, right, that says, tree rising higher still, uh, Phoenix hatchling flies. Uh, hatching phoenix flies, something like that. Uh, and of course, this iterative, this is a draft price, and this is that first little turn. I went, I went up putting colors, or words, uh, colorful words that aren't necessarily just flies, but I like the simplicity of it. So the idea is the tree is the top of this image, and then the camera lifts up, our vision lifts up, the reader lifts up their head to follow the phoenix from this highest point in the image to an even higher point still. As a game, the other element that, it's, that that's done that's important with the numbers here, but there's a whole kind of other talk that is important to think about because this is true in all the writing, all the questions, and all the numbers, it's time. What order do you ask the questions? What order do you ask the numbers to be put into? And this one, we've asked the numbers to escalate. And the question was about serenity and hope and joy. And the numbers so that as things happen in time, over time, a narrative occurs. A number by itself, a word by itself, is not a narrative. A narrative, not necessarily a story, but a narrative is a sequence of events. And it can be related as a story, it can be related as a list, it can be related as slides. Uh, it could be almost anything that happens over time. So, the hell was that about? <laughs> right? It's about these big kind of esoteric questions and how you're going to turn some of these into numbers. How you're going to turn some of these into words, into sentences, the magic. Uh, I also did this so that I could actually see what time was, uh, which means I have just a few minutes to take on some questions. I'm not looking for, I mean, I'm happy to take esoteric questions, but this is the point where I turn up these things into practice. And I help to find out how these things directly apply to the questions and the problems that you have in game design that you want addressed or, or answered or interacted with. Yes, Paul? This is a very selfish question. Great. Right. About the game that I'm designing. Sure. There was a little, there was a brief trend there in role playing games in the 80s where stats or attributes or whatever you want to call them wouldn't just have a number, they would also have like an adjective or a descriptor or a And those were usually stacked. You know, so if you have a 10, that means it's good. Right. Or if you have a 20, that means it's excellent. Right. And they would use these things, like they would say, oh, you know, this stat is excellent or this power is excellent. But you're supposed to know that means 20. Right. So what I'm hearing is I've, I've copied this. I've 
a faith choice stolen from an old game, and I'm still wondering, do I actually need to have those words in addition to right numbers? If the words just generally do you need to double down on that job? Do you need to have both of them doing the same job? Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, short answer, right? My, my opinion is no, you don't. Yeah, you don't need both. Uh, those are, the, that word is uh, indicating, I'm sort of like asked the question this way. The word exceptional, or whatever it is in your game, right, indicates the same thing as a number. That exceptional is a code that stands in for the number 45, right? because that's a more fun word to say. It makes you care to look awesome. Right. Five means mighty. Right. That's what, your, that's what number your character is fighting is, is it's five. Right. So uh, but the answer is, what I would do in modern game design is especially how I would keep it, because I think there's an elegance to it, is uh, I would not necessarily have a single word for it. I would say, if you have a 45, pick one of these three words that is how your character is a 45 out of whatever. Right. How is your character a 5 in strength? They, they have mighty thews, they have great muscles, they have a swimmer's body, they have a lumberjack's arms and, uh, uh, with great practice. They are. They can, like, have to tear a log in half, whatever it is, right? Um, uh, uh, so, or say in three words, why, what is your character's strength like? And in addition to adding the numbers so that you don't argue about who wins in a fight, and that you can build a game off those numbers. Uh, but in terms of answer, do you need it? No. That's, that's, that's a description because it's often, in that case, I think, in a game like that, it's talking about visual need. So, it's also playing into the, the visual and, tech and, and language of that, of, of, Comics, so that a number doesn't doesn't really uh, sink right. on its own. So giving it a word and giving it a number helps it play better with material. I think maybe the goal was and I'm not going to do this. Uh, I think maybe the goal was to let you know um, is this like an average person strength or is this right? Like it's sort of easy to contextualize, right? Yeah. yeah, which is which is helpful, yeah. but it's also a point which it asks if if the stats are not mighty, very mighty, mighty or still in mightiest. Right. At some point, it was a question we asked, well, is excellent or, or superlative better? Right. And then you have to just memorize what order those words go. And now that numbers. Uh, any other questions I can tackle or approach in terms of some of this is covered? But did anything want to repeat in terms of names that you went to Google, as I said earlier, is one of those questions that I always want to ask you and nobody ever lets me ask. No? Um, yeah. Can you write the book? Uh, sure. Which, which area in particular do you want me to kind of zoom in on? Oh, great. Um, boy, uh, one of the books uh, I've been kind of great teaching textbook for game design in a lot of ways, but it is a formidably priced book. But if you can find it somewhere, it's a, uh, uh, The Art of Game Design a Book of Lenses. It's a pretty broad book about how to design games and is iterative upon games. But a, a similarly great book that is more affordable and it asks you to play thoughtfully and asks is about questions. It's Improv for Gamers by Karen Twelves. Um, that's uh, a great book about the narrative approach, and it's also that book that I published that I feel comfortable playing. Uh, uh, it's about sort of the narrative and getting the character and the questions that can be asked at the table uh, about playing well. Um, so those are two very different directions and also two different kind of, depending on what kind of body you want to plan. We have time for one more question. Can I talk about the white box? That as a resource that people who want to take that Absolutely. In fact, I'm going to do it. The white box is a box of meeples and a great book uh, that I did not write, so it is great. And I feel comfortable telling you it is great. <laughs> uh, it's a great book about game design, particularly uh, uh, board game design from design to publication, uh, that contains meeples that are of random, sort of not random, but a mixed assortment of colors and styles and types of meeples so that you can prototype your game with the white box. It's produced by Atlas Games, my company, Game Playwright. Uh, publishing. Um, it is a little game design workshop in a box, and there is actually one of them available as a prize this weekend. So if you are playing games and coming to talks like this and getting your sheet signed, uh, you've got the opportunity to win that uh, uh, tonight, so don't be too early, and be sure to get those sheets signed so that you have a chance to win the white box and get books like Hamlet's Eight Points by Rob Kiwaz, uh, and a great variety of other products that are here. Uh, and they're written by people who are a little less esoteric and Goofy about some of these concepts, but I think that it's also important to be a certain group about some of these concepts to push the walls open. And I hope that I have done that with you today. Thank you very much. Five minutes till the next one is Big Ken Hyde talking about world design, restrooms in the back. And if you need people to sign